Today, we conclude our series, Committed and Focused, by looking at the final part of our common goal as a church. We've already considered our common commitment, which is we do life together, and we have covered now the first four tenets of our common goal, which is to be first, to be focused on God, involved in ministry, respected by peers, strengthened in faith, and today we look at number, four, number five, to be transformed by Christ. Uh, the first, this final tenet of our goal reminds us that every church member must be a born-again believer who is also growing in Christ. Not only is a person transformed by Christ when they turn to Him in salvation, but they are also continually transformed by Christ, and then they will ultimately be transformed by Christ when they go to heaven. These are what we call the three parts of salvation, justification, sanctification, and glorification. Justification is the moment of salvation. We might say, I was saved. Sanctification, then, is the ongoing process of being transformed by Christ and becoming more and more like Him. So we might say, I am being saved. And then glorification is the final state of salvation that happens when we enter heaven and we might say, I will be saved. Let me explain it in a personal kind of way. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we've been going through the LeCount campus membership books so that we can get the information we need and enter all of that into our database here. And it was fun to me to find the book, to find the H's, to find Stuart Holloway, and to find September of 1987 when I made my profession of faith, and then October of 1987 when I was baptized. So think through justification, sanctification, and glorification with me. In 19 1987, I was saved. I was justified. Uh, Jesus made me, as someone said, just as if I'd never sinned. I was declared righteous and saved. But ever since 1987, I have been being saved. I have been being sanctified, or as the kids might say, sanctified. Because I am becoming like a saint. I am becoming like Christ. So for the last 35 years, Jesus has been making me more like him. And then one day, hopefully a long time from now, the Lord will take me home and I will be glorified and enjoy the absence of sin, the perfect presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the glories of heaven. The same is true for every one of us. Some of you have not yet been saved. You have not been justified. But some of you have been saved. You are being sanctified. And one day, we will experience a change of address to our permanent home in heaven and be glorified. This morning, we're talking about a goal of the church which means the people who have been justified because we believe in a regenerate church membership. That means that all members of this church should be saved. You should be justified, and now you're being sanctified. So the goal then of every member of our church should be that we are continually being transformed by Christ. You do realize that you never stop being transformed by Christ, don't you? Uh, no matter how long you've been saved, you still need to grow. Whether you were, you've been saved for 35 minutes, 35 years, or 95 years, you still need work. And that's what this goal is is all about. And so if you haven't already, turn in your copy of God's Word to Titus chapter 2, this little short epistle written by the Apostle Paul. It's called a pastoral epistle because in it, Paul is helping out by giving some instructions to a young leader named Titus. And Titus, um, Paul had left Titus on Crete to guide a new church that been, had been established there. But there was a problem that was in the church and that was heresy. 
Christian heresies were all around that area, and Paul believed that one remedy for the spread of heresy is if in the church the true followers of Christ would live transformed lives. And if they did, they would have impact for Jesus in their community. And so we certainly want to have impact for Jesus Christ as a church. And so let's note how spiritual transformation can happen in a local church. First, spiritual transformation is nurtured by intentional discipleship. Look at Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. So what is that? Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the Word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything. Set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. In the church, everyone needs spiritual transformation. This happens through a process known as discipleship. And discipleship is much like a mentor relationship when one person helps another person grow. It's not filling out workbooks. It's doing life together. Notice how Paul describes this discipleship process. He gives Titus a way to disciple each generation, both genders, and even the social levels of society. And so we find here that both discipleship and multi-generational ministry are built into the fabric of the church. Both nurture transformational ministry. And so as Paul describes, it looks like this. He starts with the older men. He says, older men, you need to be role models. He says, you need to be sober, which of course means you don't need to be drunk, But it primarily means that you need good judgment and wisdom, which drunk people do not have. You are to be worthy of respect, which reminds you that there's somebody watching you, namely the generations behind you. You're also to be self-controlled, and that applies to your actions and to your words. Paul says you older men should be sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. This emphasizes the need for older men to persevere in the faith. As Paul says, uh, as writer of Hebrews says, fight the good fight, finish the race, keep the faith. Younger men need you. They need you to be committed to the Lord, to set a worthy example, to hold them accountable. Our younger men need you to show them how to put the Lord first in life, Uh, serve him in the church, to love a wife. They need you to demonstrate and talk about good stewardship of your time and money. They need to watch you handle disagreements with grace. They need to see you be strong and firm in the decisions while also being godly. And so after finishing talking to the older men, he then talks to the older women and he says that You need to nurture spiritual transformation, especially in the younger women. He says you need to be reverent in the way that you live. That means you can either be an example of how to be or an example of how not to be. But those under you are going to live the way you model life for them. Second, Paul says you older women must not be slanderers. The Greek term for devil comes from the Greek word slanderer. Kind of an interesting note there. So think about this. When you speak lies or make accusations or spread gossip, you do the work of the devil, 
not of Jesus. Paul comes down so hard on this because Satan uses gossip and slander to destroy the work of God in churches. Like the older men are to be sober, the older women are not to be addicted to much wine. So that makes us ask, why so much talk about booze in this passage? It's because first century culture often admired heavy drinkers. I don't know why that was. But they often did, and God does not. He doesn't think it's good. He doesn't think it's funny. In fact, he declares it unacceptable for his people. And so older women, you must be above reproach so as not to become a stumbling block for the women behind you. No younger woman wants to take her spiritual cues from a gripey, drunk, gossiping old biddy. They want to take their spiritual cues from a woman in whom they see spiritual strength, who they see love for her husband, who they see in her a godly legacy in her kids and grandkids, a lady who has been where they are and has either survived and also has both survived and thrived. When you live like that, Younger women will gravitate to you quite naturally because they want what you have. And then you can teach them. Younger women, Paul says you need to be dedicated to your family. You're to love your husbands and children because in that stage of life, that is where your focus is. You're to be self-controlled and pure, to be productive, to be kind, to live in a right relationship with your husband. Your love for your husband and for your children must be second only to your love for God. Nothing else must take priority over those three top things. Anything else in life, career, hobbies, come under God, husband, and children. He mentions here self-control and purity, and and when, when those are linked... They express a concern for marital fidelity. So you must control your attitudes and your desires. You must work on your marriage so that neither you nor your husband will fall victim to sin. Interestingly, in in my ministry, I've worked with far more couples where the wife has committed adultery than the husband. So this is interesting that this is the emphasis that Paul gives here in Titus 2. And part of purity is modesty. So watch how you dress, watch how you act. But younger women have it hard. It's a hard stage of life. Being a wife and a mother is difficult, especially in the preschool years. And just about the time you've got it all figured out, the teenage years come. It's a hard season of life. Of life, And for those who juggle wife and, and, and mom and career, that's, that's extra hard. But let me say this. Your husband should help you. And here's how that happens. Paul says here, you need to be subject to your husband. He's not saying that you need to be barefoot, pregnant, wearing a prairie dress and bring an iced tea to your husband while he sits in his uh, easy chair as the lord of his castle. <laughs> Let that sink in a moment. <laughs> yeah, I said lard. <laughs> That's not what that means. That's what our culture thinks that means. What it means is allowing and encouraging your husband to be the spiritual leader of the home that God has called him to be. And if your man is living as the man of God that God wants him to be, then the mutual love and respect between you will help you do life as a team. And when you do life as a team, your life will then glorify Christ. And so, as Paul says, no one will malign the word of God. So, we've got the older men, the older women, the younger women. Now, what about the young men? What's there for you? Here's what Paul says you need. The humility to allow yourself to be led. Notice that Paul says in verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. There's just one exhortation for young men. Why is that? Because Paul knew that young men need self-control more than anything else. Boys take longer to grow up 
than girls. Uh, some guys in their mid-20s still look, act like eight-year-old little boys laughing at bodily functions. It's time to grow up. And so that is what Paul points out here. That lack of self-control shows up in the spending habits, in the hobby obsessions, in how they treat the opposite sex. So Paul lays into young, women, young men with one word, be self-controlled. Young men are not so much taught, though, as they are led. Most young men learn best by doing instead of studying. So most men are hands-on. A, a sit still while we instill kind of discipleship doesn't work. There needs to be iron sharpening iron. Men alongside men. Young men need to watch an older man wrestle with his business and his family while the younger man wrestles with his business and his family. They've got to be able to ask questions along the way as they rub lives together. Uh, for instance, young men are not going to attend a five-week seminar on ten ways to do disaster relief. But you tell them, hey, we're going to do some disaster relief on Saturday. Bring your chainsaw. They show up ready to go. And then you say, okay, let me teach you a little bit just for a second. They're eager to do. But you've got to teach them along the way. But if a young man lacks the self-control Paul says he needs, he cannot be led by an older man. Because without self-control, the younger man will never be humble enough to listen and learn from the older man. So notice how spiritual transformation is nurtured by discipleship. The young men need to be able to be led. The older men need to be worthy examples. The, the young women need to be dedicated to their home. The older women need to be worthy teachers. There's something for everyone. If you're older, the generations behind you need you. If you're younger, the generations ahead of you have something to offer. Paul even goes into verses 9 and 10. He talks about Christian slaves, how they can act, that can help them to win over and even disciple their masters as these slaves live transformed lives before their masters. Now, this discipleship process is not so much a formal program where we meet for a weekly class and go through a workbook as it is a natural life-on-life -life process. It's also not a, a pyramid kind of structure with some teacher at the top who teaches some others, who teaches some others, who teaches some others. As I read this and reflected about this, I think it's more like gears, where each of us is like a gear in a machine that's doing its part, and that gear affects another gear, which affects another gear, and we all work together, no matter your age, no matter who you are, to move towards an intended result. Uh, the mentorship cycle is ongoing. It never ends. You teach others. You learn from others. You never reach a point where you do not need to mentor or be mentored because no matter your age, you are always being transformed by Christ. Of course, you need to find the right mentor for the right stage of life and your goal in life. Now, our family... Last weekend, watched Minions, The Rise of Gru. Anybody seen that? We've been fans of the Minion franchise since it kind of came out. And 12-year-old Gru's dream is to become the world's greatest supervillain. And so after training his whole life to prepare for this moment, to become a villain, Gru is invited uh, to come interview to take the place of his most favorite villain ever who is a part of the Vicious Six, who is just an incredible crew of evildoers who have a top-secret lair deep underground. Unfortunately, when Gru appears for his interview, the other remaining five of the Vicious Six find out he's just a kid, and so they dismiss him. Intent on getting the position, intent on showing the Vicious Five now who he really is, Gru decides he's going to steal one of their highly prized acquisitions, and when they see him steal something from themselves then they will accept him into their group. Well, I won't tell you anything else. That's the first couple of minutes of the movie. Gru's dream is to be transformed from his minion's mini-boss into a despicable member of the Vicious Six. And so he picks out who he wants to mentor, and he has envisioned what he wants to become. 
We do a similar thing in the church. We pick out a vision of what we want to become, and we pick out mentors to help us get there. I just hope that nobody wants to become despicable as a part of being in part of the church. But spiritual transformation is nurtured by spiritual discipleship. But we also find that spiritual transformation is modeled by godly lives. When Christ comes into your life, you change. Everyone who is a true follower of Christ should be different than what they were before Christ came into their life. Now, note how Paul says this in verses 10 to 14, or 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good." When a person surrenders to Christ, the Lord changes them. They are justified. But he begins a work of transformation that continues throughout that person's life. And as that process continues, through those years of sanctification, spiritual transformation is evidenced by a godly life. In verse 12, Paul says, our actions are transformed. We just do different things. Because our passions are different. And then he, he, he's saying you, you no longer conform to the pattern of this world, as he says in another letter. And that's because your focus changes. As he says in verses 13 and 14, your hope is now fixed on Jesus and his coming. And there's a day when you're going to see him again. This transformation impacts your life. It is demonstrated to others. Godly lives do more to bring about change than anything else. I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people today love to push for change by sharing their opinion of truth on the Internet. But rarely will divisive opinions cause change or transformation in the lives of others. In fact, it, it's always interesting. You'll have somebody state something and there's a comment that says, oh, this probably won't change your mind, but... And then they just <laughs> hammer them down. It's not going to change them. In fact, what usually happens is there's more hurt, there's more division. To bring about real change, you must take time to be in people's lives. You've got to love them well, even when you disagree. So that means playing a whole lot less thumb war... And more being the person who loves on them, the person who calls, the person who grabs a coffee with them, the person who volunteers in their schools, the person who leads in the workforce. If we want the truth of God's word and the power of his grace to influence the broken world around us, then we must start with ourselves. We must live godly lives as evidence of the spiritual transformation that is happening within us. Because only when they see that God has changed us and is changing us will they listen to how he can change them. These, uh, these verses are intensely personal. You will find that others will listen to you when you find yourself living like Jesus. These verses bring this discussion back to each of us where we have to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and yes to Jesus Christ. Spiritual transformation is modeled by godly lives. It's nurtured by spiritual discipleship, but it also spiritual transformation is promoted by godly leaders. The right leader makes a huge difference. I bet even more of you have seen another blockbuster movie right now, Top Gun Maverick. Yeah. Anybody seen that? It's a, it's a huge, amazing movie right now. Tom Cruise's character, Pete Maverick Mitchell, has spent more than 30 years of service as one of the Navy's top aviators since he graduated in Top Gun, which was the subject of the first movie. He's where he belongs. He loves pushing the envelope as his courageous test pilot. It also makes sure that he dodges any advancement that would keep him out of the air. 
But he's called upon in the movie to train a detachment of recent Top Gun graduates for a special and very dangerous assignment. So these young, talented Top Gun aviators all get together, and one of them asks, everyone here is the best there is. Who are they going to get to teach us? And in walks Maverick, an old man to them, but one who will push them to the limits, who will have to battle the ghost of his own past. But after demonstrating his own competency and earning the respect of the young, young aviators, greatness happens as the right leader leads the right people in a common mission. That's what Paul has been calling Titus to do, to be the right leader leading the right people with a common mission. And when he does, greatness will happen. Titus has been taught how to teach all these people and then how all these people are to then take what Titus has taught and teach others. Now he gives another pointed word just to Titus wrapping up this little section in verse 15. He says, these then are the things you should teach, all this stuff above. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Titus, everything above what I've just said is what you are to teach. But now, lead with authority and don't let anyone despise you. Now, how in the world is Titus going to do that? Uh, the older members of the church may have looked down on Titus as a, as, as a young guy. The younger guys in the church may have looked at Titus as just one of the guys. How is he to teach with authority and not be despised by other people? By doing what Paul's been teaching, modeling spiritual transformation. When the people of God see the transformation happening in the man of God, they will listen and be encouraged to press on in their own transformation. Now, certainly this principle applies to the pastor of a church and to the, the spiritual uh, ministerial staff of the church. But it also applies to the lay leadership of the church, to the deacons and to the Sunday school leaders and Bible school leaders. Anybody who's in spiritual authority must set that model of spiritual transformation. No one expects spiritual leaders to be perfect but they do expect them to be held to a higher standard and to be modeling spiritual transformation. You can't lead in spiritual transformation if you do not live a godly life. That's because authority is both granted by God, but it's also earned from other people. And so spiritual leaders must ensure that they are worthy of both. And when they are, then they will not be despised. I want to be first in my life. In fact, when we developed this goal years ago, over a decade ago, it resonated with me as something to continually pursue as a man. I want to be focused on God in everything that I do. I want my worship to be passionate. I want that to impact my life. I want to be involved in ministry and, and seeing what God does through and in me. I want to be respected by peers. I, don't want, I want to be above reproach in, in everything that I can do. I want to be strengthened in faith to know what I believe and know why I believe it. And I want to be able to look back and be able to see that every day I've been transformed by Christ. And I hope that's your goal as well. Because it is our common goal as a church. But it's that final tenet to be transformed by Christ that really drives everything else. And we all have plenty of progress still to make. I did some figuring this week. I saw that date, 1987, of my salvation and started playing with how many Sundays and how many sermons. And I realized that since I was saved in 1987, I've heard or for the last 19 years preached myself some 4,000 sermons on Sundays and Wednesdays and uh, church camps and revivals and conferences and whatever else. It was probably more than that, but 4,000 was a good estimate. That's a lot of preaching. That's a lot of sermons. You know, the sermons of others in my own sermon work have convicted me. They've challenged me. They've certainly motivated me to change. I've changed in a person. I, uh, as, over those 35 years, I've grown as a follower of Christ in those 35 years since I was saved. But you know what? I'm a long way from where I need to be. 
I mean, I could walk through this week and say, here's some ways that I failed. Here's the rough edges that were still there in my life that God continually needs to transform. And, and the same is true for you as well. Because we're continually being transformed by Christ. The song we learned as kids is so true. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the moon, the stars, the sun, the earth, Jupiter, and Mars. So good, how loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. 35 years for me. Less for some of you, more for some of you. My sanctification process still has a long way to go. Yours does too. So the challenge is let's be transformed by Christ. And let's help one another be transformed by Christ as we do life together and seek every day to be first.